Five flat earth, globe earth explorations to do on or around the June solstice. Get yourself outside and make some measurements. So this is basically an overview of five videos that I've done, and I'm gonna have uh, links uh, in the description to all five of these. Three of these are focused on observations you could do on the June solstice, and two of them you could do any day of the year, but wouldn't it be nice to collect five different uh, pieces of data on the June solstice to determine the shape of the Earth? The first main objection is I'm focused on the sun, so people say you can't tell the shape of the floor from the shape of the sky, and y you may say that's a, that's a good point. For example, this uh, auditorium has a sloping floor and a flat roof. Uh, this is a planetarium with a flat floor and a domed roof. And then here's a hybrid, a sloping floor and a domed roof. So it may seem that is, that is correct. You can't tell the shape of the floor from the shape of the sky. But that is actually a um, sort of a red herring. No matter the shape of the Earth, whether it's flat or globe, the sky will always appear to be a hemisphere. So for that reason, none of my do-it-yourself explorations um, involve finding the shape of the, of the sky. The sky appears to be a hemisphere. No matter, no matter what the shape of the Earth is, the sky appears to be a hemisphere. So I'm going to focus on different attributes of the sun, not the shape of the sky. The second main objection is that the sun, moon, and stars are just lights in the sky, right? Just lights in the sky. So here's an analogy for you. You tune your TV to a, to a blank station and you get this static white noise, psh, okay? Now, now imagine that that's the night sky and you have your telescope there and uh, do you see any patterns? Do you see any repeating cycles? Is it just a bunch of random motions? Is it just a bunch of unpredictable lights in the sky? And the answer is no. When we go outside, the, the night sky is not just a field of static, okay? There are very, very predictable motions, very dependable cycles, uh, and these can be studied and analyzed, all right? So these are not just lights in the sky. You can analyze them. So my argument is that if you live on a globe or if you lived on a flat earth and you can see the sun, say, I could see the sun just fine from where I live, all right? Well, why not analyze that? So the even though they're, they're quote unquote lights in the sky, can you carefully observe them and study them? The answer is yes. So all of my do-it-yourself explorations will return results or data, whether the Earth is a globe or whether it's flat. You will get data regardless, okay? So carefully observe uh, the sun and you'll get a lot of res re results. Now, what if it's not exactly the date of the June solstice? So fortunately, um, we're, we're in a good spot on the curve here. So what is this curving graph? It's the latitude of the subsolar point. And this graph is accurate on both globe and flat Earth models. And what what do we mean by this? Well, it's the path of the sun across um, the, the, the surface of the Earth. I mean, the sun's not moving across the surface, or maybe it is uh, if the Earth is flat, but basically it's the subsolar point. So what location on Earth can they look 90 degrees overhead and see the sun? So on the two equinoxes, the March and the September equinox, the sun is directly above the equator. In fact, we say the sun crosses the equator on the equinox. And on the December solstice, the sun is above the Tropic of Capricorn. And in the June solstice, the, the sun is above the Tropic of Cancer. Now notice that it's a curving, it's a curving graph. So here we are approximately June 21st each year. Maybe it's June 22nd, depends on the year. Well, there's a, a little window about two weeks, you know, two weeks before, two weeks after or so of the June solstice. Uh, the sun is pretty darn close to the Tropic of Cancer. So all of these explorations can be done, you know, say within two weeks of the, of the June uh, solstice, and you'll, you'll get pretty good results. So on these five explorations, it's well over an hour of, of content. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're just going to do a quick, you know, speed reading uh, glance through these explorations, starting with angle of elevation of the sun. So what you need is a solar clinometer, which you can make uh, for using a little dollar store protractor. Um, and when you use the solar clinometer, you point it directly at the sun and you take a reading. All right. Now, if the Earth is a globe, the angle of elevation of the sun should be 234 degrees northward from where it would be on the equinox. If the Earth is flat, uh, you do a little bit of trig, but it's it's not that difficult. If you know 
the elevation of the of the sun. You do a little bit of trig and you can figure out the angle of elevation, the predicted angle of elevation of the sun. All right. And then this is a summary, a summary screen of the math involved in both. The next exploration is the azimuth of sunrise and sunset. Now, I'm pretty sure that my channel is the only one that seriously discusses the math of predicting the azimuth of sunrise and sunset on both flat earth and globe earth models. And the math does get very ugly. Uh, so one of the things you, you need is a, an accurate way of measuring azimuth of sunrise and sunset. Because, you know, you see the sunrise and it's like, can you tell exactly how many degrees that is? Um, so I recommend that people make a cardinal azimuth tool or a cat tool. Um, and then here's a photo of me using the cardinal azimuth tool. And it's just basically four yardsticks uh, um, connected together. Now, if the Earth were a globe, you're going to start with your latitude and you're going to do a little bit of trig. Here's a side view. And then we're going to go back to a top view. Now, that yellow circle is the sun. And you can see that it, it is rising north of due east. All right. And you just do the math. It's, you know, it's pretty ugly, but you can actually predict the angle of uh, the azimuth um, uh, of, of the rising sun. Now, if the Earth were flat, uh, you're going to make a different triangle, one where one of the vertexes, uh, vertices, is at the North Pole, another one is at your location, and the third is where the sunrise is. And then you're going to analyze this angle uh, using a little bit of trig, and you can find the expected azimuth of sunrise or sunset. Now, because the math is so uh, tricky, I've created an online calculator. So you're welcome to use the online calculator and it will predict the angle of azimuth of sunrise or sunset. And there you see the, you know, the difference between the globe Earth and the, and the flat Earth. All right, so you can play with that. The third exploration is on the path of the sun. And this is my favorite. Uh, people like to tease me about, oh, you just want to stick a toothpick in a pizza box. And, well, you can. You can stick a toothpick in a pizza box. You can make yourself a sundial, and you want to mark it every hour on the hour. You want to be very uh, rigorous about this because the, the spacing of the marks is going to be important. So if the Earth were a globe, um, the, the path that the, the, the marks will take will be a hyperbola, and the marks will not be equally spaced. Notice that they're spaced further apart at the ends, close together in the middle. All right, so it is going to be a conic section. Specifically, it's going to be a hyperbolic pattern of shadow. And I tried this out on an actual globe, and I moved the globe a certain amount of time each each tick mark, and, and it did turn into a hyperbola with unequally spaced marks. All right, if the Earth were flat, the geometry predicts that it's going to be a circular path, like a semicircular path, and that the marks are going to be equally spaced around that path. All right, and I tried it out with a little model of uh, my Gleason's map, and uh, it did come out to be a circular or a semicircular path with equally spaced marks. All right, so, so there's the summary, uh, either a hyperbolic versus circular or unequally spaced marks or equally spaced marks. All right, so you should be able to tell um, from, from this exploration. Now, any day of the year, you can do these last two explorations. So if, the next one is going to be on the, the apparent size of the sun. All right. There's two ways of doing this. One of them is to use a tinfoil, um, a pinhole solar observer. All right, pinhole solar observer. Basically, you're making a pinhole camera uh, out of a long cardboard box. Now you cut a flap near the end of the box so you can see the image. So there's the image. It's almost like where the film would be if this were an actual pinhole camera. And there's a gra piece of graph paper in there so you can make some accurate measurements. All right. The other way you could do it is using a, a digital camera and then a piece of number 14 uh, welder's glass, uh, and that'll give you a, a, a nice crisp image of the sun with no glare. All right. So if the Earth were a globe, it's really simple. Uh, the sun is so far away that it doesn't change uh, distance from sunrise to sunset, at least not appreciably. So the sun is going to stay the same size from, from sunrise to noon to sunset. But if the Earth were flat, the sun does get closer to the observer and further away. So you have to do a little bit of trig. Um, and I, I picked a sample location in uh, southern Missouri. And comparing the uh, distance to the uh, sun at noon versus the distance of sunrise and sunset, I, f I found it to be a, a two, 2x ratio. So in other words, the sun would, be, would appear to be twice as big at noon versus at sunrise and sunset. All right. And then I did that for all the latitudes on Earth. And... Uh, 
And it does, it does really depend on your latitude, um, what the expected size change is between noon versus sunrise or sunset. All right. So there's your results. Uh, the sun should be about twice as big or, you know, maybe 1.5 times as big, maybe three times as big uh, if, it's the, if the earth is flat. But the sun should stay the same size uh, regardless of the time of day if the earth were a globe. And the last exploration is on the apparent speed of the sun in the sky. All right, again, we're going to use our pinhole solar ob observer. Uh, and this graph paper is going to come in really handy because we want to very accurately mark the the location of the sun. And when I say market, what I really mean is we're going to take a photo and then 10 minutes later we're going to take another photo. So you're going to take a photo of that graph paper, um, a pair of photos, 10 minutes apart, and then you're going to run the math. So I took another sheet of graph paper and I actually mapped it out and then measured it with, with a ruler. And then you just run the, you run the numbers. So the, you know, on my example, the sun had moved 1.4 inches and you, you convert that to uh, what the time was, and it turns out it was 7.8 uh, inches per hour, which you can convert to degrees per hour if you know the specs on your on your pinhole observer. All right, and that was just for one period of time. Um, you want to record this either near sunrise or sunset, uh, and you want to record it uh, near noon. Okay, you want to see if the sun is moving faster in the sky uh, for one part of the day versus another. Now, if the Earth were a globe. Um, it's not the sun that's moving, it's the earth that's turning. So the earth is turning around 15 degrees per hour. So the sun, even though the sun is appearing to move through the sky, you know, we know that's just an optical illusion, but it should move through the sky at about 15 degrees per hour all day, all right, if the earth is a globe. But if the earth were flat, uh, well, the sun is changing its distance to us. It's, it's either moving towards the observer or away from the observer. So here's an illustration of, uh, you know, the little car, a little toy car. It's moving the same speed the whole time, but it's making a smaller angle when it's further away, a larger angle when it's closer. So it's going to appear to move faster. The closer the car is to the observer, it's going to appear to move faster. All right, so that's what we're going to analyze on the flat earth model. So again, we're going to just use Missouri as our sample location. And you can see, and it's a little bit subtle in this picture, but you can see that the angle is smaller near sunset and it's a larger angle uh, near noon. And again, the math, you know, do a little bit of trig. Um, and I measured it to be 23.2 degrees uh, per hour um, near noontime. And again, this is just for a sample observer in Missouri. But then I did, ran the same analysis and I found it to be moving 11 degrees per hour uh, near sunrise or sunset. So that's a 2.1 times uh, difference. And again, this is just sample numbers. So just to, to recap, for this Southern Missouri observer, uh, the sun should appear to move 2.1 times as fast near noon as it does in the sky near sunrise or sunset. All right. And again, this definitely depends on latitude. So your results, you know, the sun, if the earth were a globe, the sun's going to move the same speed across the sky. If the earth were flat, it's going to appear to move faster at noontime. All right. So those are the five explorations. And uh, sometimes people, you know, they, they get results and they don't really like the results. They're like, well, I'm going to explain that away. Um, so let me give you an analogy on, on tracking a wild animal. Now, let's say you see some evidence of wild animal activity. And what can you analyze? Well, you might want to take a look at the, the footprints. And you may say, I know what kind of animal this is just for, from its footprints. You can analyze the, the pattern of the footprints. So was it pacing? Was it bounding? Was it galloping? And different animals have different you know, methods of locomotion. You can also measure the stride length or the straddle width or even the pitch of the paw prints. Okay, And that will tell you a lot about the actual animal. Uh, and how it was uh, locomoting. And then lastly, you can examine its poop, and that tells you a lot about what kind of animal it is. All right, so let's say you see this footprint. Well, you may say, well, that's a deer. Okay, that's, those are deer prints. And you may say, well, I'm, I'm analyzing the, 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 the pattern of uh, footprints, and you're like, well, these, this is definitely uh, representing the way a deer would walk. All right, and then finally you look and you find some poop. And this is definitely deer poop. So you've got three completely different pieces of evidence. The shape of, of a single footprint, uh, the, the, the stride length and the gait, and then the, uh, the poop. And then they all point to the same thing. They all point to it's a deer. So my hope is that you're going to use as many different pieces of evidence as possible. 
And these five pieces of evidence, they really have nothing to do with each other. I mean, they're all about the sun, but the angle of elevation of the sun at solar noon has nothing to do with the azimuth of sunrise and sunset. I mean, they, they're literally, they're nothing to do with each other, which has nothing to do with the path of the sun in the sky, and it has nothing to do with the apparent size or the apparent speed of the sun. All five of these attributes are completely, they're measuring completely different attributes. All right, so if you perform all five of these, we have a expectation if the Earth is a globe, we have a different expectation if the Earth is flat. All right, so I, I do hope you perform as many of these explorations as possible. And the full details are in the five videos that I'm linking to. Now, Brian Tracy says, there are no limits to what you can accomplish, except the limits you place on your own thinking. Thank you.